Okay, we're might, might moving on to the expert uh, panel uh, discussion, and uh, Minister Murphy is going to be staying with us. Um, and we've Patrick O'Reardon and Graham Stoll from the uh, European Semester Officer and the European Commission who are going to be here with us. But two people who won't need an introduction to John Fitzgerald, who's the adjunct professor at Trinity College, and uh, Mary Sherlock, who's the economist at SIP2, are going to join us. I'm actually going to ask um, perhaps John and Mary, you might maybe even give some, some opening remarks uh, before we move into the, to the main Q&A session. All right. Um, as the Minister said, the economy has been growing fairly steadily and rapidly since the second half of 2012. Employment is growing at 2.5% a year, GDP, GNP growing at maybe 5% a year. If this continues, by the end of next year, we will be approaching full employment. Um, the current account balance payments deficit may be moving back into deficit adjusting for special factors, and the economy will be at capacity. If on top of that the government succeed in doing what they need to do and getting Ireland to build 15,000 more houses a year, this economy will be fit to explode. Um, my estimate is that would reduce the unemployment rate by 1.5%, add 1.5 percentage points to the current account deficit, and add 1.5 percentage points to the, growth rate, to the level of GDP. Under those circumstances, the Irish economy will need substantial action, fiscal action taken by the government to take money out of the economy. And I am very concerned the Commission are caught up in the rules rather than looking at common sense. And this happened in the last decade. In 2003, the ESRI recommended if the government wanted to build a load more social houses, they had to raise taxation, take money out of the economy to make space. That did not happen, and we saw it see the consequences. In the next budget, the government will need, at the very least, to have a neutral budget and probably should begin to take money out of the economy. In other words, taxes should be raised, not cut, in the next budget. And certainly in the 2018 budget, if all goes well and things continue, the government will need to take a lot of money out of the economy through increased taxation, or they could cut expenditure, but that doesn't seem a wise move. The Commission are so caught up in the rules and the past that they are talking about, oh, we must eliminate the structural deficit. This is not what Ireland needs. In 2003, 4, 5, 6, when the Commission came to Ireland, we said, will you not give Ireland a speeding ticket? And they said, we can't because they're obeying the rules. We've heard the Vice President talk about how Ireland is obeying the rules and they need to get, eliminate the structural <coughs> deficit. I think the Commission needs to wake up and use their common sense, their macroeconomics, rather than the rules. Um, and recommend to the government, because it's going to be very difficult for this government in the next budget to raise taxes, and if not in the next budget, certainly in the following budget, to take one or two percentage points of GDP out of the economy by raising taxes, they're going to find it difficult. They are going to need assistance from the Commission in doing the wise thing, and I'm afraid the guidelines don't do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mary. Okay, um, thanks. Well, I, I suppose similar but a slightly different note. The first thing to say is, um, and I suppose to start on a positive note, that I actually agree with some of the recommendations, the, the country-specific recommendations, particularly in terms of uh, what they say with regards to health and childcare, um, with regards to the need for more permanent restructuring of non-performing loans, uh, and indeed Durable talked earlier about the, the absence of, of, of reference to housing. So I suppose they're all very positive things, but, um, and these calls are all very much grounded in the need for additional investment in the Irish economy, uh, and I wholeheartedly support that, but I suppose the elephant in the room is the fiscal rules. And I suppose John made the very potent point there that there is such a, uh, so, so such as the blinkered thinking about the surrounding the fiscal rules at the moment, that we're not thinking logically about how the Irish economy needs to develop over the next number of years. I suppose it was interesting to see um, the media coverage about uh, the, uh, the, the country specific recommendations and, and how Ireland was exiting the excessive deficit procedure. Yes, it's an important institutional milestone, but I suppose I'd have to disagree with the Minister and say I don't see it as a game changer, because at the end of the day, the uh, structural deficit targets that we have in, in order to try and meet our medium-term objective by 2018 are going to impose very tight budgets on us over the next three years. And I suppose the key question is, how are we actually going to introduce those very tight budgets and uh, uh, do all the spending that they're recommending? So there's an issue about speaking out of both sides of the mouth. 
Um, so I would really have to take issue with the Commission's recommendation of the 0.6% uh, adjustment uh, in this upcoming budget, uh, particularly on the point when you look at the experience of the past number of budgets. Um, I think the second thing is it fails to recognise the head start that we got last year in terms of the 2.4 billion in unanticipated um, uh, resources into the in, into the, the, the public uh, finances, and indeed how about 80% of that was actually. Um, I, I suppose uh, came into the base was attributed to structural as opposed to just being cyclical. So I think it's an important point to make that ultimately that we're being blinkered so much by the, the, the uh, there's such a focus on the fiscal rules that it's, it's impossible to see how we're going to be able to meet those spending commitments that they say we need to commit to over the next number of years. I think the second thing to say is um, it's interesting in terms of the timing of the publication and of course you know it has to happen at this time of the year but it, it came just uh, 14 days after the publication of the program for government and I suppose an interesting benchmark to see well what is the incoming government you know how much of it is going to deliver on on the recommendations that have been issued to this country and in particular with regards to the tax base and the recommendation to broaden and strengthen the tax base and I suppose there's three you know, particular areas of concern in terms of the income tax, and I suppose I'm relieved that um, the new political arrangement has in some ways, uh, um, I suppose, altered or reduced the scale of Fine Gael's ambition with regards to uh, abolishing um, uh, the universal social charge, uh, even though there's about a billion of, of, of a difference, I suppose, in terms of what was originally proposed or what we're likely to see now play out, I think, with regards to housing. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the price fees and how are the, the cap on, on uh, the, the local property charge expires in 2019. Where are we going to go from there? It's not at all clear to me that there's going to be any appetite to try and increase um, the, the local property tax at that particular point. You know, it, it could be just after an election or coming into an election. And I suppose the third uh, big issue is with regards to, and it's not a tax, but of course it's with regards to Irish water and, and water charges and how uh, we're going to try and fund the 5.5 billion capital programme in water um, over the next number of years. So I suppose just to conclude, um, I think there's some positive things in terms of you know, wh where we need to go with regards to spending commitments in the Irish economy over the next number of years. Um, ultimately, we know that uh, we need to spend if we're to improve the productive capacity of the economy, but I don't see any evidence of how, you know, what leeway we have to do that, uh, given the constraints that are upon us at this point in time. That's great. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're going to have the Q&A. Please, if you just let us know who you are and uh, where you're from. And I'll just begin, uh, John, just, um, by asking you, when you look at uh, <coughs> the legacy debt in terms of uh, the national debt, even public or personal <coughs> and private debt, um, do the headline figures, the really big figures, overestimate the strength of the Irish economy, or are there vulnerabilities there? No, I think the headline uh, uh, figures underestimate the strength of the economy. Um, the debt is being funded at an incredibly low interest rate mm. because of other factors in Europe. Um, if you look at the debt burden in Ireland today compared to the debt burden um, um, uh, e existing in the crisis in the 1980s, it's about 8 percentage points lower or 7 percentage points lower. The, basically, the story is not about the debt mm. and the security of the debt. It's been refunded long term. Um, if, if the economy continues to grow, um, and they sell off the banks and so on. So the Commission are so come up, caught up, and I think your question reflects this, in the past. And if you look at their forecast for Ireland, they consistently, they, they forecast to do their job, and then they knock one or one and a half percentage points, because in the past, the risk was what Ireland would underperform. People have got so used to that, they're not looking at the risks of Ireland overperforming. And I think that we need to refocus to a more balanced view of the world. And um, debt is, is the private sector debt is a significant burden and a significant problem. Public sector debt is, dealt, is being dealt with. Okay, just a question from this gentleman. Hello, my name is Michael Ewing. I'm the coordinator of the Environmental Pillar, an advocacy coalition of 28 national environmental organisations. Uh, Vice President Adam Crofts, we've talked about broadening the tax base. And, um, your reference to the, uh, and also the, the, the record council recommendations you refer to the need to uh, spend uh, capital funds on climate mitigation and environmental measures. I, I guess the question is, why aren't the government doing this? And why haven't they had to make provisions for the, <coughs> these serious issues that are coming down the tracks in terms of climate change particularly, but also in terms of uh, property, uh, controlling property development through site value tax, etc.
Thanks for the question. I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting one, right? Because what we try to do in terms of one of the, the measures that we, we did in both in terms of taxation side and charging um, in relation to water, and that side of, of what we're trying to do, and, and we run into some difficulty there. We now have the current situation, I don't know if you can hear me, sorry, where you know, water charges have been suspended temporarily pending a review by a commission, but we still have all this work that needs to be done in terms of investing in the infrastructure and, and, and really getting people to, to believe in the polluter pays principle. And that's posed a significant challenge over the last number of years, and it's going to continue to pose, uh, be a challenge for, for the coming couple of years. I mean, and just to be absolutely clear about it, Fine Gael believes that we should be paying for our water, and that there should be water charges there. And when you look at the, 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 the recommendations from the, the Commission, and I talk about having a broad tax base, that's part of having a broad tax base. It's part of also having consumption taxation. Um, so it's been a worrying development that we've now found ourselves in a situation where we've had to suspend those taxes. And that the political dynamic at the moment might, might seem that despite what the Commission recommends when, it, when it's set up, when it comes back in nine months' time, that, that we might be moving to abolish uh, water charges, which would be a very worrying development and a regressive step. Uh, insofar as uh, investing in, uh, you know, in, 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 say, in protecting ourselves from climate change and, and looking at the environment, I think the program for government does identify some of the challenges there that we need to address and that we need to try and find consensus on how, on how we address them. Very recently, the Minister for Health set up this whole party committee in the Oireachtas to look at a 10-year plan for health spending and our health service in general. And at the initial stages of the programme for government, or for, sorry, the government formation talks, that's exactly what we were talking about in relation to climate change, um, having that exact same approach, because we are going to come up against problems, I think it, uh, is it 2020, 2021? Um, when we move into that cycle, if we haven't done anything by then, we're going to have serious problems post-2021. So that, I think that, that risk is recognised. Um, we're about two or three weeks up and running, so once we have that chance, we're going to move into that, in, in, into that space very quickly. And just the, the, the last part of the, the question that you raised in relation to, to housing um, and different taxation, I mean, there's a vacant site levy in place due to come in force in 2018, and the idea of that is to ideally get people who are sitting on vacant sites to develop those sites so that we can use it for housing and, and for other you know, needs that we have at the moment in relation as well to office space and other areas. But it comes back a bit to, to a challenge that, that I think John Fitzgerald has, has kind of outlined in terms of, you, you know, we have some, some, some immediate challenges in this country, and a, and a real immediate challenge is the risk of Brexit, what may happen. That's right on the near horizon. But, but, but stepping back from that, and when we pass the, the referendum on the 23rd of June, regardless of the outcome, we also have a huge problem here in terms of infrastructure and infrastructural development. And a lot of money needs to be spent and invested in our infrastructure. And that is going to be money coming into the economy. That is going to be uh, the creation of jobs and then the impacts resulting from that as well. And uh, I'm not sure how you square that circle in terms of what John's talking. I mean, if the economy is overheating or is about to move to a point where by next year or end of next year, we're moving into a dangerous situation in terms of overheating. At that same time, we're going to be moving into, into increased capital expenditure because we need to do it in terms of schools, roads, homes, you know, hospitals. So. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure how we're going to address that. Yeah, <coughs> sorry, if I could just come in on uh, uh, John's earlier point and also uh, to speak to Marie's point a little bit there, maybe just provide a little bit of the Commission's perspective on, uh, on our take on the fiscal rules and how they apply to Ireland. Um, so just, just to clarify, moving from the excessive deficit procedure into what we call the preventive arm of the Stability and Growth Pact is a bit like going from a really exceptional situation that Ireland has been in for the past uh, six years, seven years, into uh, what we would call normal times. And the logic behind the fiscal rules as they apply in normal times in the preventive arm is you benchmark your progress towards this thing that we call the medium term objective, and the Vice President said this before, against uh, the potential level of growth in the economy. And the logic, be that's a lot of fancy jargon, which basically boils down to when your economy is growing really, really fast, that's the time to exercise fiscal restraint. When your economy is not growing as fast, that's the time uh, where you have a little bit more uh, scope for engaging in, in, in fiscal spending. Now, in order to actually do that on a technical level, and this is where we do tend to get very technical in, in our analysis, sadly, uh, it's difficult to break it down in simple terms, is you have to measure a thing called potential output. And the problem with that is it's a, it's a notoriously difficult animal to get your hands around. Um, so 
that's where it gets very technical, and that's where I think it's, it's very easy to be frustrated with how the rules work and how they apply, particularly to small open economies like Ireland. Our overriding message to that is, while we, while we will set out those parameters in the fiscal rules, and it is our job as guardians of the treaty to, um, to promote that, uh, on a policy level, our message is, these are guidelines, and prudent fiscal management does not prohibit a member state from going beyond those guidelines and really acting in the spirit of what I think John was suggesting when he said, look at the strength of the Irish recovery and think about maybe uh, reining in spending a little bit more. Um, so w when you're unsure about calculating these very technical things, that really is the time to think about fiscal prudence. Well, uh, according to the Commission's recommend recommendation <coughs> or findings, the private non-consolidated uh, debt stood to at 266.3% uh, of the GDP. What uh, specific uh, measures uh, intends your government to take in order to address this issue? That's one question. Uh, the second issue is oh, what kind of, it, since there is so much uh, shortage in housing, yeah, that there is a problem, and if we see uh, the prices of uh, selling or buying or rent are excessively high. So what kind of incentives your government will give in order to promote investments towards this uh, sector. And third, uh, among all these um, uh, restructurings proposed by the Commission uh, or by the European Union, uh, there are some hints concerning corporate tax. Is your government ready to uh, examine the possibility of uh, aligning the corporate tax with the levels of 17% proposed by, the, by Germany? Thank you very much. Some very, very interesting <laughs> questions there. Um, and I don't know which of the five, maybe, perhaps maybe uh, take the, the second one first um, on housing. Um, Mary, maybe the, the incentives do you think that should be required uh, for investment and to, to resolve the housing crisis? Well, I, I think um, it's very interesting for the government to talk, uh, asks that the government be judged, its performance be judged on whether it actually ultimately resolves the housing crisis and homelessness, which sets the bar very high in terms of, uh, of how we, we measure its, its success or failure over the next number of years. Um, look, there, there, the housing crisis is multifaceted, and, and I think there's, go there's, there's certainly no magic bullet but ultimately, the government has to get involved, the state has to get involved in house building. And I suppose I hear the term crisis being bandied about again and again. And to me, a crisis is defined by when we actually employ abnormal measures and not the measures tried and tested of old. So I, I know that there is, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the housing committee and your office is doing a lot of good work at the moment. Um, certainly there's about, four pages in the book where government is dedicated to housing and talking about a whole raft of measures. But ultimately, I'm not at all convinced that it will actually crack the nut of trying to remedy our housing issue over the next number of years. Because I think ultimately, we need to deploy significant levels of state investment, state-driven investment. It cannot be arm's length in terms of depending on tax breaks. Yes, of course, the private sector do, will need to be part of it. But the state is going to have to drive it, and, and, and significant amounts are going to have to be deployed to that. Um, and, and ultimately, that we have a healthy mix between private <coughs> and social housing uh, built across the country. Um, but I'm not, like, there's 100 million euros of a housing fund about to be put in place. Um, sums vast in, in, in excess of that are going to have to be put in place if we're going to meet the target <coughs> of 100,000 100, houses over the next five years. And can I just say, tax incentives are not the way to go. I recently discovered my granddad's notes from her lectures from A.C. Pigou, one of the greatest economists of the past, from 1922. 
and in bright lights she had highlighted the fact that a tax on property ends up on the landowner, that if we give give away uh, uh, VAT concessions, it's going to go to the property developer, not the buyer. So tax concessions are not the way to go. It is operating on the supply side, and as Marie said, it's a multitude of different uh, policy measures are needed. Uh, just, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think when John talked about tax measures perhaps not being the way to go, I mean, this was discussed. There is, there is an element of the programme for government about potentially looking at something to do with VAT um, when it comes to, uh, to, to housing and to land, and there was a debate over whether that, that was the, the right course to take. And now that we're in this, this new politics, these decisions will very much be for things like the dedicated housing committee that have, that have been set up. Um, I mean, it, it's a supply side issue. One of the problems that we've dealt with in, in Dublin City for a number of years is the amount of void properties that the council manages. These are, these are properties that are empty. They're not being used and not being turned around quickly enough in between uh, different tenants. We've also got a huge amount of empty stock in, in the city. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible how, how long some of those properties have been vacant. Um, and Simon Coveney, who's the Minister for Housing, has said he's not afraid to take on radical ideas and, and, and radical solutions. And there's also a possibility that the European Investment Bank um, might have a role to play, or the new Juncker Fund. Um, but there'll be difficulties there in terms of if we're moving into public-private partnerships because of some of the changes that seem to be coming down the line through, um, through Eurostat and how we're going to be accounting for public-private partnerships. And I know that the Taoiseach's written to the President of the Commission and the President of the Council about this because there's a risk at the moment that current projects in the pipeline that are meant to be off balance sheet could be brought on balance sheet and there's a risk that, that the projects that are off balance sheet already might be brought on and that'll have a significant um, impact in terms of the management of our public finances if that were to happen. And so I know that we're, we're, we're hoping for perhaps a bit more open and transparent dialogue around that. Uh, and well, no, I mean, 12.5% rate is not for changing. Um, but what we've been trying to do and what we've been keen to do <laughs> is to lead um, internationally with the OECD on, on their, you know, the BEPS program and also in relation to elimination of the double Irish. Um, I think that's quite important because it's important for our own brand and how we sell, for, sell ourselves abroad. But for an open economy like Ireland, our 12.5%, it's, uh, it, it's of national importance. So it won't, it won't change. Alan, and then this gentleman uh, just up behind you. Thank you, Alan, for your uh, concurrence. Uh, I think John is right to, to criticize the application of the rules as, as they are. Even if we have a properly articulated common fiscal policy for the Eurozone, there isn't enough leeway in the rules the way they're written for the kind of progress that Germany should make under the CSR to deal with the problems in the other member states. Uh, and we boxed ourselves into a totally impossible set of rules. And I, I disagree with Wayne. You know, it's all very fine to say that when things are growing, when an economy is growing fast, it's time to be fiscally conservative. Uh, in general, yes. But when an economy is growing fast, just coming out of recession, you need to have you know, a bit more subtlety uh, about the way you go about it. And that is not there in, in the rules as they are. Um, the Commissioner talked about the tax base, and he mentioned, um, as far as I remember, if I got it right, he talked about taxation on consumption, um, on services, and on property. Um, I think he's probably right. Um, I think, uh, although not all the time will agree with me, I think the 52% margin of the tax base is about as far as it can go. I had the pleasure myself many years ago of applying a much higher margin of tax rate. And I didn't get hugely popular as a result. But I think 52 percent margin of tax rate is enough for any Christian or pagan that they have to deal with. <laughs> so that means in this economy, we should be looking at increasing taxes on consumption, on services, and on property. Um, Mary mentioned in passing, I think, property tax. There will be a major row about any increase in property tax here. Um, we are about to do I am afraid something very stupid about tax on services when we talk about Irish water, whether it's temporary or permanent, it is going to be a god awful mistake which we will regret. Uh, and we've been there once before. Remember, we abolished water taxation in 1997, just when it had begun to work. Uh, and we have a pension for doing that in this country. Um, and then go back to, to other taxes on consumption. Um, there's, there's actually rather a bit left 
Our VAT rate is not low compared to other countries. Um, if the experts are to be believed, and people like me spoke as to be further oppressed by a huge increase in taxation, it should reduce the income. Um, the only two taxes that you can make a good case for now on any economic or environmental grounds are, are taxes on tobacco and taxes on motor fuel. Um, and I don't see that there's going to be leeway uh, in budgets this year and next year to make major changes there. And as I say, if you make, there's one of them where if you make major changes, you actually should be reducing the revenue. Um, on investment, uh, I think there are umpteen reasons for investment. I wish incidentally that the, uh, the public service unions would stop talking about increases in personnel in public services as an investment in public services. It's not. It's a provision of public services, it's not investment. But we are going to have to get realistic about investment. Um, even if we were to move a bit outside the rules, as, as John, I think, implicitly suggests, it would be on the investment side. Um, I agree with Barry, most of the housing has to be uh, from public sources. We need a major program of publicly funded house building, um, both to deal with the immediate crisis and to stimulate the private sector into, into some kind of action. But we're going to have to make choices. There isn't a snowball's chance in hell that we can get the kind of investment people are looking for in housing over the next two to three years, and at the same time, have large investments in the provision of health infrastructure, schools infrastructure, or transport infrastructure. We are actually going to have to make choices. And if you look at, listen to the public debate, as it has been going on here since well before the last election, people are not talking about choices. They're talking about everything at the same time. And, you know, looking at the public debate as it's gone on up to now, and looking at the situation in, in our legislature, I don't see any appetite for making those choices. The vast majority of the law is against water charges. The vast majority of the law will be for increasing investment all across the board without any corresponding increase in taxation. And even if we maintain USC unchanged, there is still not enough revenue there to support the level of services that, that we're arguing for. So we are going to have some huge problems. The final point I make, it's a question really. Um, what are the CSR recommendations for Germany, particularly on the investment side, and is the Commission confident that they will be adhered to? Thank you. Actually, Philip is going to share, Philip Robert is going to answer just on your last question there. I'll briefly stand up. Uh, so I'm, I'm the chief economic analyst that the vice president of Washington has referred to. So anything direct to the commission issues for Brussels as well. Please feel free to that to me. Uh, briefly on, on Germany, the uh, commission recommendations is uh, use the fiscal space uh, to, to run a slightly more expensive fiscal stance and in particular expand public investment. So I think that is also in line with what vice president said in his address here. We have a mighty expanded fiscal stance at EU area level, which is appropriate and certainly Germany has fiscal space, so the Commission thinks you know, they should use it. And there's certainly also scope in Germany to improve public infrastructure, so why not use the money that we have and, and spend it? So that's a recommendation. Uh, the degree of implementation in Germany of, of country specific recommendations, uh, of course, can only speak for the past, is not very high. So. Uh, Clearly, overall, also there is an issue about CSRs, so country specific recommendation implementation ratios. They have been relatively low, but I think we have made quite some progress by focusing them more and bringing these discussions exactly to the countries, into the countries, and make sure that we pick up on issues that are also of political relevance. You know, in the past we had recommendations on issues which were just not politically of interest in the specific country. They were maybe economically relevant. But you know, to, to get the, the ownership, to get countries really moving, you have to pick up on something in the country. So I think we have made progress on that. Mm -hmm. um, I would also like to, to use the opportunity because there has been some talk about fiscal rules. And they are very close to my heart. 
coming from Brussels. Um, I've, I've done a couple of events of, of this type in, in other capitals. And you won't believe it, but in every country you go to, you say, well, your, your rules are fine, but we are different. No, no matter where you go, you have uh, large budget to countries, you know, with exaggeration of about 50%. You have countries with small budgets, you know, around 33% of GDP. You know, everybody tells you, yeah, yeah, these rules, yeah, yeah, we, we basically agree, but you know, for us it's different. You know, for us, we shouldn't count investment or we shouldn't count this or that. Um, so they ain't working, no? Rules are rules because they are applied across all countries. So there's no single rule for every country that isn't a rule anymore. So we have to make certain provisions that are applicable across countries. And as my colleague uh, said before, the idea of the rules is set some minimum levels. You know, give you a speed limit, say, look, guys, you know, this you shouldn't uh, go faster than that. If on your domestic side you think this is still not enough prudent and we, we want to be even more prudent, fine. You know, there, there will be nobody uh, banning you for that. Uh, on the specific case, uh, on the projection by, by Professor Fitzgerald. Okay, then you talk about where are we in the economic cycle? Are we already at the peak of the cycle? Are we at the risk of overheating? Our assessment is there's still a negative output gap, so you're still below what the economy could produce. You still have unemployment, which is coming down, but you know, this is still really high. Inflation is not visibly exploding. So there are also some reasons to assume that you know, this growth rate that we project for next year is sustainable and we should not unnecessarily try to, 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 to calm it down. Of course, if you implement huge investment plans, things will change, but the government has only been in place very short, so uh, we will not make a judgment on that. Thank you. Minister Amory, I know you don't want to go on that. Well, thank you. Just, just very, very briefly on the, on, the, on the last speaker, I mean, I'm not so sure about the one-size-fits-all approach myself, and I know that in relation when it comes to calculating the structural uh, budget balance, those red lights weren't there using the methodology. They weren't there in the Nordics and John Fitzgerald pointed this out, and I'm not sure maybe they're not there now either. And I, I, I suppose there's a preference, I think, on the Irish side to look more towards the expenditure benchmark rule, um, if you're to look at a rule. And just to, to comment briefly on what Alan, Alan Dukes said, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm still too new to politics to disagree with Alan Dukes. <laughs> Definitely still too new to Fine Gael. But just on one point, and I, and I do agree with, with almost everything you said, Alan, um, I think investment in people is an, an investment in public services. I do. Um, and I, I think there's, there's some investment there that, that's needed, personally. Well, uh, I suppose, kind of similar to, to the Minister, I, I, I'm not sure that many of us would have said when we came to vote for the Fiscal Compact Treaty in 2012 that the rules are fine. Um, I, I, I think most of us will recall at the time that there was the degree of conditionality with regards to the accessing the, the uh, European Stability Mechanism, which we thought we might have to do at the time. So I think there were huge concerns about the, 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 the nature um, of the rules, as the Minister said, and particularly with regard to the methodology. Um, and, and I suppose it's only really now, because we have exited the, the excessive deficit procedure, um, that we're really seeing, seeing to see the impact of that over the next number of years. That's great. Uh, this question from this gentleman just in the background row. Thanks. I'm uh, definitely an honourable member. I have a background in um, foreign industry. something the 
The second thing is legal services. In Portugal, the Troika did go into the issue of delays in the judiciary, the judicial system, um, costs in the legal services, as serious drags on the economy. And they are here too, not only in relation to decision making in regard to commercial disputes, which hold up decisions by companies and therefore a drag on the economy, but also decisions in relation spectacularly in Ireland to infrastructure projects, constantly held up by litigation and by slowness. So I'd be very interested if the, if the panelists um, would address that, and perhaps Alan Dukes also, but not in his financial hat, not in his previous hat, but the Minister of Justice, where I had the pleasure of working with him in the past. Thank you. Maybe you want to say the lady had, or yeah. the, the legal services, the well, Justice uh, Fund is the longest, uh, yeah. those come out of the programme, is one of the longest ones to get in the statute books. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the bill itself, the, the legal services bill, when it was first drafted, was a huge piece of legislation. And it was uh, contained uh, reforms in across every aspect of the legal services and how people use legal services, how they regulate themselves. Um, and it, it got into difficulty at different points in time for different reasons, some on the political side, but it, it was passed. And what we're seeing now, I think, is, is the beginning of some important changes. On the cost side, though, of legal, of legal services and, and, and the cost of accessing legal services, the state did drive a pretty ambitious program in terms of driving down costs. And it, it, because the, the state itself is a significant purchaser, if you like, of legal services. And, and, and on that side, we did our, you know, our best to try and drive down costs while making sure that, that it was cost competitive and that we could have a you know, properly functioning legal, legal system. Um, and in relation to the speed, sorry, yeah, the, the other issue of accessing the courts, I mean, the Courts of Appeals is now being set up. Um, there's further work to be done there uh, in relation to you, you know, moving more quickly through the court system when we have to, and there's been Things have been done around, you know, personal injuries and, and that side as well, but um, there are the, 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 the legislation is still new, if I could say that, and there is still work to be done. Um, Brexit being the elephant in the room, absolutely, and you know we're sitting here, we're not passively waiting for it to happen or what might happen. Uh, John himself uh, authored or co-authored a very detailed paper last year um, with the department. There's been some more work that's been done internally in the department in the last number of weeks as to the potential implications, the, the risks, the opportunities, if there are any. Um, and and so, so we're looking at that also from a political point of view, ministers and from the government are getting involved in the debate. We've got to be careful about how we do that as well because you know obviously this is a sovereign decision for the, the people of the, the UK, but there's somewhere in the region of 400,000 Irish people living over there who have a right to vote. There's somewhere in the region of 230,000 UK citizens living here who have the right to vote. Um, we can play a constructive role with them. We can play a constructive role up in the north of Ireland, which I, I hope to do next week when I go up myself. But you're right. If, I mean, if, 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 there's go if there's going to be an exit by the UK, there's going to be significant consequences, not just for our economy, but also for the, 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 the geopolitics of the European Union as well. Um, and then for managing the kind of crises that are going to continue, like the refugee crisis, which is so important um, and which will continue. Um, and then on the other the point you made in relation to the healthcare system, yeah, like. <coughs> It's very frustrating, and when we came into government in 2011, we, we had a, a, a plan, a 10-year vision, we thought at the time, um, for, for reforming health care and reforming access to health care. We know that we don't get the return that we get, that other European citizens get for the amount that we invest as a state, and that's a significant problem. We know that more investment needs to be made, and I think we know now that we need a, a new model, a model that focuses on care at home, that focuses, focuses on primary care centres and that's moving towards these ideas of hospital groups and that management structure. But the whole purpose, I think, of the Minister's you know, cross-party <coughs> committee on health is, is rather than have health continue to be a political football that's kicked around in the Dáil Chamber and kicked around at election time, is to find a consensus that will outlive the party and government, that will outlive uh, elected TDs and that, 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 that can continue to be implemented regardless of who's sitting in the chair. You know? Yeah, just very quickly. I, I, I suppose that, well, uh, and I suppose the interesting thing is the recommendations kind of highlight the uncertainty with regard to the future direction of the health system. I'm, I suppose, um, 
I, I, like, I very much welcome the initiative by, by Minister Harris uh, in terms of trying to seek cross-party support for, for a common vision. We don't know where that's going to go, of course, but we have to give it the benefit of the doubt at this point in time. I suppose to me the really important thing is that in this country we have a public hospital system and a private primary care system. And ultimately, unless we crack that nut over the next number of years, we won't begin to resolve the, the endemic issues in terms of financial management within hospitals and all the other issues and, and, and demographic pressures in the, in, in, in the Irish health system. Um, so, so ultimately, I suppose, it's it, like, then I think there is a possibility now of putting things in a new direction, but you know, we'll get to see what's going to come out of that. Just to one question here, and then there's two at the back of the room. I'm just reading the, the words of the first recommendation about uh, increasing the cost effectiveness and the quality of capital expenditure. Mm -hmm. They don't actually say increase the amount of it. Uh, and the extra four billion over the next few years is very welcome, but it needs to be three or four billion extra every year. Um, I, I agree with you on the need for investment, and it's got to be funded out of taxation, so I hope that IBEC recommend increases in taxation to fund that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to take uh, this lady here and here, and then that should bring us close, uh, fairly close to time, but... Uh, state of the legislature, uh, but the, the whole potential political instability, how are you going to manage and execute the choices in circumstances where, where the government has bounced into new legislation, uh, essentially on, on, the, uh, on the mortgage rates, when the government lost the vote earlier this year? I mean, how are you going to manage and execute those choices when, when there is that level of instability? Well, I, I'm just, I'll come back to that in a moment if I can, just to, 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 to reply to that lady, uh, Vincent de Paul, on, on her question. I mean, language is so important around this. Okay, and in terms of how we communicate. And I fell foul of this myself in the Fine Gael Parliamentary Party meeting yesterday evening when a motion was raised about mortgage arrears and people being evicted from their homes. And I stood up and I spoke in numbers and figures and was almost killed by my own parliamentary party because I wasn't communicating at all to them. And if I had gone out and said it to anyone outside of the room, I wouldn't have been communicating to them either. It's one of the reasons why at the moment in politics around the, the world, not just in this country, the center is not holding. Um, people are, the, 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 the people who kind of maybe think that they represent the centre in some way have lost that ability, I think, and I'm one of them, I guess, to effectively communicate what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And it's lending itself to populist arguments, but also 
very shallow analysis of what's actually happening. So you're right, if we talk about labor market activation, what the hell does that mean to most people? Um, and Catherine Byrne spoke about this last night, who's our, our new minister for, for the drug strategy, about taking a white sheet of paper approach to everything that we're doing. Um, we have got the fiscal space to fund what we're committed to in the program for government. It's about six billion in, in, in public investment committed between now and 2021. I, if the government gets to that point in time, that's in public spending. There's another four billion in, 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 in capital spending on top of what's already in the capital investment plan that was published last year, and which is the gentleman refer referenced to will be reviewed next year and there might be an opportunity to see how much more you can spend. Guidance counsellors, yes, it's in the program for government and, and, and that's one of the investments that we're going to make and that's where the money's going to go and when we talk about investing in people being an investment in public service, that's what it is. Um, early learning initiative. There is a fantastic program being done out of the, the National College here in the Docklands. Just in this area, I don't know if people here, some know about this area well, but. This area has obviously our silicon docks and it's got our Irish Financial Services Centre, but it's also got some levels of very high deprivation. And, and, and the two communities haven't been brought together properly. Um, and it's a real shame because it was an opportunity at the time that the investment was being made those years ago that wasn't taken and we're now trying to do it now. But things like early learning initiatives, which are getting funding increases every year, and again, it's a commitment in the programme for government. It's about putting resources in at the very early ages of life and not just putting them into the classroom where the, the child might benefit directly, but putting them into the child's home in terms of how the parents are interacting with the child, how the parents are interacting with each other. All those things do make a difference, but they do take time as well. But education is, is very much where it's at. And in relation to health, and it comes back to moving to a single tier system, that's what we're trying to do, is to provide a universal health model. And so if your child is under six, free access to GP care. If your parent is over 70, free access to GP care. And over time, we're, we're going to, to, to reduce those levels and increase those levels, so it'll be under 18. We're also bringing in dental care as well as part of that. So, this is how we hope to spend the money to try and improve people's lives. But coming back then, Durbel, to, the, to, the, to the, the, the question of the politics of this and how long will we last, um, we, we have something new here now. We have a, a proper minority government. It's a partnership government. Fine Gael's the majority in that partnership, but we've done it then with a, with a mix of independence. We have a confidence and supply agreement with Fianna Fáil, um, and we have this program for government. And it's not something that we've ever had to do before. And we spent a lot of time over the two months of government formation talks looking at how other countries do this. New Zealand was a particularly good model, given that they're a similar, a similar parliamentary system, a similar, similar uh, legal system. And the first time they did it, it took them a couple of months to put it together, and it lasted a couple of years. The second time they did it, it took them a few weeks to put it together, and it lasted a few years. Um, what we have an agreement with is a, is a midterm review with Fianna Fáil as part of our confidence and supply. We've agreed economic and social policies with them, and that will guide us through making sure that our program for government can be implemented in tandem with that. I'd love to tell you that we can go five years and that everything's going to be done by 2021 that we have in this program, but I can't say that to you because it, it, it requires a new approach, not just from government, it requires a new approach from the public sector and the civil service as well. Um, and it also requires a brand new approach from the opposition. And personally, I'm not seeing that new approach yet. Um, but one of the litmus tests will be the Housing Committee and the recommendations that come from that. If they come with reasonable, good objectives that we can actually implement that aren't unconstitutional or aren't illegal, then great, we'll have something to go with. But if they don't, then we're going to have problems getting a proper action for plan for housing off the ground. Um, and that's one of those difficulties. But for me, I'm actually, opportuni I'm, I'm, I'm actually um, I think there's an opportunity here. I'm kind of optimistic about it because there are some very good parliamentarians there. Um, and if, if we can find a way for those pol politicians who actually want to get things done rather than prepare for the next election and increasing their voter base by being populist, if we can find a, a consensus among us and actually show progress, but it'll be tough. Show progress in housing in 12 months, it'll be tough. Show progress in health, it'll be tough. But that's a challenge that we've set ourselves. And um, we're going to go back to the people and ask to be judged by that when the election comes. And I hope we've got a good message to sell. Just just briefly to, to Neil's point on the, 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 the spending issue and stuff. So we do actually say, we do say prioritise capital expenditure and we do mention some public infrastructure. So I think we have sort of taken a, a position in terms of priority, prioritisation and what areas we want to, to look at then. And then just to, to Audrey's point briefly to say clearly the social focus on it, the, the, the concern we have on the, the poverty issues and on, on childcare and that, that that is you know, very clearly set out in our proposals and remains at the heart of our concerns. Just a final question here. Um, my name is Joe Dickinson from Situ. Um, question I have is in relation to the childcare leaking. Uh, the recommendation is to increase the 
improve the provision of quality, affordable, full time childcare in the county. I'd like to ask the question to the commissioners. What exactly is the commission's understanding of the quality childcare uh, model? And the um, commission is what needs to be done to achieve this model, including in relation to retaining well trained, well qualified staff in the county. Um, Indeed, Joe, I mean, I think there are, you know, with the childcare, the, the availability and the affordability are, 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 are very important, but the quality as well, I mean, that came across, I think, very clearly in our discussions with, uh, with various stakeholders that it's not, you know, it's really important that it's not just about putting people in there so that, you know, people can go out to work as such. It's really, you know, that is the most important element is that the care that they're getting in childcare is, is, is top notch. So it's about the personnel, their capacities. It doesn't need to be PhD sort of uh, qualifications, but that the people involved in, in delivering the care are well, you know, are the right people, that it's not, that the, the work is valued, that it's considered to be a high value work and that there's, yeah, it's, it's part of the equation that there's provision made for, for, for all these aspects of it. So it's availability, affordability, but the quality is essential as well. Okay, well, uh, we've moved from uh, normal times into potential uh, overheating, which you might not have heard of in uh, quite some while, but I suppose what one of the key issues we're going to today is the, the level of flexibility uh, given uh, the fiscal rules. On uh, your behalf, I'd like to thank all of our panellists, Graham, Patrick, John, uh, Mary, and the Minister Murphy. Um, it was my job to deliver you by 3.30. <coughs> Thanks for your time. Thank you.